if I can't, that's too much. It's too much already. Uh, yeah, my cousin and I went there one day after I came and we made the mistake of getting gifts for the Chicago style. Yes. Did already? I think each of us. Oh, my cousin is I don't know anything. over Windows. six feet and a roller, so he eats a ton. Oh, okay. He couldn't eat more than two pieces. Uh, that's really you eat it? I know. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 Basically, the after was due. Yeah, and but he was the way he was talking about it was like he thought we were still working on it. He's like, like, yeah. yeah. He's like, I want to make sure we're on the same page with the homework. Blah blah blah. blah, blah. <laughs> so this is what you're doing. And we're all like, that shit was um. So we basically did it wrong. It's not expected. Basically. It sounds like it is a mask. Oh, no, 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 Oh, Firework filter, flyway. What's the name? Leave us. I had to use someone to the project. You're a really nice. Let's color code them for the flaws. Uh, these are the keys you need. Find them in the dark. Yeah, I like it. I can actually turn the keyboard and like backlighting on too. Yeah. So, this is totally random, but I This is backlight those. those I, 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 I just presume it's special. Okay. Like, like, and then I, I, put, I put the little uh, cover on it. Type Did everybody fill it out? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Because I think since that that survey happened, some people have dropped. Right. 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 I think I have that same sweater. <laughs> That's very possible. <laughs> Standard issue. Yeah, you guys didn't get emails. I think email files are like my email. So you register for this course and be on a wait list for a bio course. Sometimes it like so I so I so I so so Thought, but I want to like, 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 like,
So, in the future, I'm probably going to wait to see if I can get it. If people can get it, I'll get it. And then I'll get it. 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 But it's a shame because there are some files that keep doing that. There's a lot of hat that I can read. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 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 I'm
So there is definitely a need for better quality input to provide the, the provide for analysis, and this can be done by trying to tease apart the heterogeneity at the upstream stage. So we try to tease apart the tissue heterogeneity and provide you with uh, provide you know uh, provide uh, samples that we know more a little bit about. And what do we know about tumor heterogeneity, and you know um, how can we go about this uh, problem? So, in, with regards to tumor heterogeneity, the tumor invasion front is one of the better study fields within this area of uh, where the tumor invasion front demonstrates clear phenotypic differences from the rest of the tumor. And also, you know, the tumor invasion front is also the um, a key feature of cancer invasion. And so, you can, if you as if you remember, I, I recall I say that you know when cancer invades, the survival rate drops. So the tumor invasion front has a positive correlation with survival outcome. So how do we do this? How do we study this? Well, to, to begin with, the cancer invasion process is a, is a very complex biological process that involves an interplay of multiple factors. This can be broadly classified into extrinsic or intrinsic factors. Extrinsic factors can fall under mechanical, biochemical, or cellular. And so now, nowadays, you, you hear a lot about immune therapy. Um, you know, um, that's part of the cellular uh, component of the extrinsic factors. And on the other hand, you have the intrinsic factors uh, coming from genetic instability, such as microsatellite instability, <coughs> nutritional burden, and as well as epigenetic uh, causes such as DNA methylation, histone acetylation. And you can imagine that these this two uh, broad, cl broad classes of factors are actually interplaying with one another uh, to play a role in this uh, complex biological process. So, Studying this uh, complex biological process using the relevant models is really crucial in ensuring that we are able to make any progress. So why the current, current, currently, why are the available model systems for us? We have, in, essentially, we have in vivo or in vitro. On the in vivo side, we, have, we can look at it in the patient. But that, of course, brings up several issues because we are trying to cure patients. We're not trying to kill them by letting invasion occur. And so the majority of in vivo work is actually done using non-human animal models. Uh, the problems with non-human animal models, of course, ease of use, cost, and you know, the, the fact that you need specialized uh, personnel, uh, personnel trained in animal handling to uh, study this. So it's not surprising that there's a lot of attention paid onto in, in vitro devices. Uh, in vitro devices can be broadly classified into 2D and 3D. And of course, yeah, I'm pretty sure everyone, uh, most of you know that the 2D culture devices are quickly losing favor among you know uh, cancer biologists as they are not really they really lie right at the extreme end of the, you know, they're not really physiologically relevant. And a lot of attention has been paid onto um, 3D culture devices, uh, microfluidics, organoid culture. Um, and in fact, this is where, we, where I focus my attention on developing a 3D culture of, um, uh, I guess, uh, of cancer biology progression. And more importantly, the device that we construct must be compatible with patient material and different cancer types. So with this in mind, I'll just quickly jump into the uh, description of the device that I developed. Um, so this is a this is work that we published recently in 2017, um, uh, scientific reports. Uh, it is essentially a fluidic device that supports the growth of cancer cells as a tumor mass in a 3D environment. Uh, to put it simply, it's this chamber uh, made of PDMS. So PDMS is a compound used in microfabrication of fluidic devices. It's optically clear. That allows you to that allows us to obtain um, uh, bright field images uh, relatively easy, easily. So it is a, uh, a it is a sealed chamber made of PDMS with three channels running through the center of the chamber. In each of the channel openings, we put adapters. As you can see, the alignment of the adapters are not flush. You, the, the adapters in the middle channel are actually closer towards the innermost of the chamber than the rest. There is a reason for that, which I'll explain a little bit later <coughs> on. Um, essentially, what we do is inject the chamber with collagen, or before the collagen polymerizes, we put an object there to mold the fluidic channels, and as the collagen polymerizes, we withdraw the needle, and we leave behind a fluidic channel. And in the middle channel, we inject cancer cells, which can be captured as a, which will be um, kind of grown as a tumor mass. So <clears throat> down here will be a tumoroid containing the cancer, cancer cells, probably about one to two million cells in here, forming a tight, compact mass. Um, so as you can see here, the, the, the scale is on the order of uh, millimeters. And you know, so we are looking at it really from a, a cancer mass point of view. And the side view, you can see this is just a side view of the device. We have a cross-sectional view where we have the PDMS chamber with collagen contained with it. 
with uh, three fluidic channels molded in the middle of the uh, collagen gel. And in the middle channel, we put the cancer cells that are grown as a uh, tumor mass. Uh, the scale is, is not the scale, uh, just, just uh, for reference. And in, and in either of the two fluidic channels, we can introduce growth nutrients by flow through a parasitic pump or uh, some other equivalent model. So the, the, the fact that we are, introducing, uh, in this, uh, we are introducing nutrients via flow would suggest that we are going to generate uh, interstitial pressure within the system. So to understand how this uh, system is distributed towards the system, we just did a very preliminary console modeling. Um, this is just a simulation. Under the, under the setting such that we have flow in one channel, uh, where channel, the middle channel where there are cells, there's no flow. And in the third channel, there's also no flow. And based on the uh, console modeling, we see that there's, a, there's definitely an uneven distribution of interstitial pressure, with interstitial pressure highest at the opening of channel A, where flow is being introduced. But overall, you can see that the system, overall system, um, the overall pressure in the collagen uh, in the region between channels A and B is actually lower than that in uh, between B and C when there's no flow. So um, with this, so that's what this, this was also a reason why we decided to um, we decided to, we decided to align the openings of this adapter further away from that of the channel because we didn't want the higher pressure to really disturb the interstitial that the, the fluidic integrity the channel integrity. So with that in mind, we uh, with this under this uh, this setup, we grew prostate cancer cells in this device, and we were able to track the dynamics of invasion into the collagen over time. And uh, this is we are talking. Uh, we're not like one two days. We're talking about three three weeks two weeks of, uh, or. So as you can see here on, on the left, and um, these are two um, face images, time lapse face images of prostate cancer cells grown in the device. And you can see this black mass here is just part of the tumoroid at day zero. And as, as the time progresses, you see uh, certain bright objects coming up into the um, collagen gel, and these are actually the invading cells. So because, uh, because of the ability to uh, capture these images using bright field, we can easily quantify the invasion rate or the invasion distance over time. And this is uh, done for both uh, PC3 and D145. So what, what you can appreciate is that um, the invasion distance of cancer cells into the collagen varies from region to region. Cancer cells invade less towards the region of uh, between A and B, where there's flow in channel A, than there, than they, uh, than that, than the cancer cells in between regions B and C, when there's no flow in channel C. So this was kind of counterintuitive because we were introducing nutrients through channel A, and you would expect that cancer cells would invade more towards the source of nutrients than away from that. So again, that, that brought up back to the fact that there was an uneven distribution of interstitial pressure, and that could have likely played a, a more of a role in directing in invasion distance than nutrient source. Um, this was seen not just in PC3, but D145 cells as well. And uh, moreover, we also found when looking at the overall invasion distance, we found something interesting, that the invasion distance or invas invasion rate of different cancer cells did not remain static over time. So as you can see here, within the first two weeks of uh, culture, DE145 were twofold less invasive than PC3. But almost like after two weeks, you can see that this um, dramatic increase, this almost like a spurt of invasion that enabled the cancer cells, DE145 cancer cells, to catch up with that of PC3. Uh, this suggests to us that there might be some phenotypic plasticity occurring in the cancer cells that would be that is that could play a role in invasion rate. Um, so I'd like to also highlight that. Um, the invasion, it is known that DU145 are less invasive than PC3 using conventional transwell invasion assays. But, you know, and so our early findings, our findings in the early, uh, early time points support that. But the fact that we see this change almost abolished after two weeks was something kind of interesting to us. So is that two kind of cell lines? There are two different types of cell lines. Two different, they are two different, biologically they're very different. One, the PC3 is actually isolated from a bone metastasis. Where, whereas the D145 was actually isolated from the dura mater, which is somewhere in the brain. So they, 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 they came from very different origins. So you know, it, it highlights, it points to you, uh, it highlights the, the heterogeneity between cell lines, between biologic samples. When, so when you're dealing with such things, you know, you're, when you're dealing with such studies, you have to bear in mind that heterogeneity does exist. And it is not static. They change over time. So in your uh, setup, uh, when the cell is growing, 
is there any uh, fluid exchange in channel B? Like, do you inject liquid? No, so channel B is sealed. So the cancer cells are, are captured within the channel. They are not allowed to migrate out of the channel. So we block the, we injected the cells into the channel and we seal them in. So the only way they could go out is horizontal, uh, longitudinally. In other words, the uh, tube that you say inserting into a channel B is only for injecting the cancer. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't, probably I didn't do a good job of explaining the advice. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, but originally, B, so B was, uh, is that liquid or is that gel as well? So it's liquid. So, um, <coughs> So, so when we model the channels, these are these three these three fluidity channels are initially empty. So, um, because you do a needle, we put a needle or some sort of cylinder in there to kind of clear the area of collagen. So, when the collagen polymerizes, that region is free when you pull out the needle. So, it leaves behind a, a kind of like a fluid filled space that we can replace with cells and seal it in. Uh, so. In this system, <coughs> the collagen gel is an uh, analog of like epithelial tissue, yes. and A is like the Blood vessel, vest vessel. Exactly. something like that. Yes. And then the B is like the tum original style of tumor. Yes, that's kind of. The, of course, we don't have endothelial cells here, but we I have had successes in um, the putting endothelial cells in one of the channels, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. Um, so um, okay, so. Uh, yeah, so, so phenotypic plasticity, dynamic changes in uh, uh, cancer phenotype. Um, and this is not only seen, uh, we cannot only just use this to study uh, prostate cancer cell lines, we can use this to study breast cancer cell lines as well. Uh, this is uh, work done in my current lab uh, where we've grown triple negative breast cancer cell lines, SUM149, BT549, and MDA231. And you can see here that we are also able to quantify the invading cells here, highlighted as these bright spots on bright field. Um, because this is a low, low objective for uh, magnification image, so you don't see a lot of the cellular features. But this is just to give you a sense of how um, the tumoroid uh, behaves. And uh, just for looking at a macro scale level, you can see that in addition to just invasion rate, you can um, there's also differences in the ability of the cancer cells to form tumor masses. We believe that there might be some underlying biological um, implications behind that. Uh, that is something of an active study. Uh, but, you know, um, I can't comment too much more on that. But it's just that some, this is a phenomenon that we observed. More so than breast cancer cell lines, we are also able to apply grow cancer uh, patient-derived material <coughs> in this device. Um, so I have successfully used this device to culture three um, PDXs, patient-derived xenografts. Um, this this is essentially patient material that have been transplanted into mice, and we isolated those tumors from the mice and grew them in this device. And we have also successfully grown uh, material from pleural effusion, which is um, the liquid isolated from the space between the uh, around the lung. Um, and this, uh, this, this uh, material is often found in patients with metastatic cancer. So we have successfully grown them for up to at least three weeks for most of the, uh, for most of the material, and we are ab also able to quantify the invasion rate of those things. Um, so um, just to give you a better sense of uh, how the dynamics uh, look like, because right now I've only shown you uh, still images, this is just a time-lapse video of the tumor dynamics. So this is one of the PDXs. So you can see as time progresses on, you see some bite spots coming up from the tumoroid mass center. And from here, you can easily appreciate that invasion is not uniform throughout the entire tumoroid for this patient. You see only specific regions of the tumor that actually have invasion. This again is, uh, this is also something of uh, significance because in clinical patient samples, you know, cancer invasion does not occur throughout. Yes. The orientation is is left up or is left down? Oh, left. Well, is where's yeah. channel A? Um, channel A is here, on the left. But you said yeah. that yeah, weren't you saying that invasion was showing more? Yeah, than... so that's that was only in prostate cancer cells. So we don't oh. see that in tumor rights here. So I'm not sure what to make of it. Um, maybe there's again some heterogeneity in biology. I, we're not sure. So this is. So it's just some preliminary data that we got, and we just uh, we are still actively studying this area. Yeah, but good point. No, definitely, definitely, good point. It's, it seems to we only see that in prostate cancer cells, but in breast, it's <laughs> we have yeah. So 
and it's PDX number two. So you can see also, you know, invasion occurring over time. In this PDX, invasion appears to be a lot more even throughout the entire tumoroid. Uh, so it suggests like there's a lot of heterogeneity between biological samples. And we are only really at the tip of the iceberg and with regards to really understanding the underlying, underpinning uh, biological reasons behind that. And number three is the pleural effusion. Again, the pleural effusion behaves somewhat similar to PDX number two in the sense that we see even distribution of invasion throughout the entire tumoroid rather than specific regions. Yes? Have you seen any concentration of <clears throat> invading cells near channel abnormalities? Like I'm thinking like uh, yeah. pulmonary embolism or something like that. Yeah. We, we, you actually see the small uh, balloons. So, so I think we've been, um, so yeah, there's definitely some stru like structural, I wouldn't say defects, but so <laughs> it's not smooth. Um, but like, is that what you're trying to get at? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, there is maybe some correlation, but we haven't really done in-depth analysis on that yet. So, um, you know, uh, so th that is taken over a period of 21 days. Um, so to give you a better sense of maybe a smaller micro scale time of how invasion cells occur during, so we use the uh, MDA231, which is highly invasive cell line, um, to take a time-lapse video of invasion over 24 hours. And this is kind of using the trackmate function in image J, we were able to kind of de uh, de delineate, uh, not delineate, but uh, elucidate how cancer cells invade. And they appear to be invading in a linear fashion. Um, I also like to draw attention, uh, your attention to somewhere down here, um, the cells down here, because in a, in this invasion does not seem to be a monodirectional. It doesn't seem to be uh, one directional. It seems to be may appear to be bidirectional. As a sense, you see that invading cells are actually going back into the going back into the tumor. Right? So, like say, almost looks brownian. I wouldn't say it's Brownian uh, because, like, say, look at this, it's really flowing the tracks back in. So, are they di digesting some of the matrix and they're? We believe that that's the so case. They might have an easier path in certain. Likely, directions. that's that's the that's the underlying theory behind like leader cells, and that's why people are so interested in studying invasion front because they believe that the cells at the invasion front are the ones leading the way for the rest of the tumor to 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 invade. Um, so I think you know, being able to study the dynamics of such a process on a real time is, uh, I think, of, of value. They all expressing matrix metalloproteinases. Uh, so later on, we, we'll talk. Yeah, about, we, yeah we'll, we'll talk a little bit because we'll, um, um, towards the end of the <coughs> towards the end of the talk, this is just to kind of uh, yeah. highlight to you the device, what it's capable of doing, and what we, you know, this is a, yeah. And later on, I'll talk a little bit about the gene expression analysis of that. Do you know why the lines? Yeah, so I think it's yeah. This is something we uh, something that we saw. I think um, I'm not sure. I think it you could be. The flow is going in one direction. That yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so that's kind of interesting too. There's something that popped up. Why is it going at an oblique angle? But it seems to be at least linear. Is, so. is channel C open? Channel C open. Is there flow out of the out of the? Well, we are, so we arranged it such that channel A and channel C are mirror images of each other, but there's just no flow going through channel C. So it's a closed loop circuit. Okay. Yeah. So it's a closed loop circuit. So you can consider it closed. Yeah. Yeah. Could there be things when you did you you put the, the cylinder in there and then cast? Yes. So could there be flaws when you're pulling it out? Absolutely. There Absolutely. Gel? Absolutely, because this is, is this, this is kind of like um, I've not achieved like GMP status of <laughs> construction, so this is still handmade and a lot. Of, uh, there are definitely flaws uh, in the construction. I I, I totally agree. Yes, yeah. I totally it, accept. It it's, could get yep. biases and things going on. Yep. Yeah. Did somebody do it by hand or pulling it out. Yes. And I don't know. Do they twist? Uh, no, you just gently just pull. Just gently it out. pull. Yeah. All right, um, okay. So additional applications of the device, we can use this to study um, effects of hypoxia and invasion. Uh, down here, we drew, uh, we drew some breast, triple negative breast cancer cell lines, some 149, under the effects of normoxic or hypoxic uh, conditions. And we find that under conditions of hypoxia, cancer cells seem to invade less than under normoxia. 
We are also able to do co-culture in which uh, co-culture co experiments. We are instead of um, so this is a uh, so previously I've talked about a three-channel setting. This is actually a five-channel setting where we have uh, fluid a fluid flow on two additional channels on the other side, and we have uh, macrophages either stimulated with uh, forbo ester or not. So in this experiment, we see that um, uh, in the breast cancer cells tend to migrate more towards the uh, the macrophages stimulated with forboester than that without. So suggesting that <coughs> macrophage, activated macrophages might have an effect, might be secreting some factors that uh, induce invasion. And we're also able to co-culture with endothelial cells. So previously I talked a little bit about um, including endothelial cells in the se uh, separate channels. So down here, I, I don't think you can see very well, um, but you know we are able to grow uh, endothelial cells in channel A with the presence of flow. So this will be a lining of endothelial cells around the cylinder. And I'm, I'm sorry that you can't see it very well, but the alignment of the endothelial cells are in, uh, are, are in parallel with the flow of, uh, are in parallel with, with, parallel with the flow. I'm sorry, yeah, parallel with the flow. And because it's GFP, so we are able to on the see. Right. Far right, far right, the other right. Okay. <coughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So you can see you know, some, uh, the orientation of cancer cells in the direction of flow. And you know, because they are GFP, we can look for any structural deficiencies in endothelial cells. Uh, I would say it's perfect because you see uh, like an empty spot here, but otherwise, you know, you generally get a pretty nice monolayer. <coughs> so, in summary, I just want to describe describe to you a little bit about the device that I've developed and some of the potential applications that we have. Uh, we we are able to do with this is um, is compatible with different cancer cell lines and patient material. Uh, we are able to achieve long term culture over weeks without disturbing the culture and the cells remain viable, and we are able to record the dynamics of uh, cellular invasion down to a single cell level. We are also able to use this to study how different environmental factors can affect invasion, and there is a possibility for co-culture with different cell types. Uh, with so many multiple possibilities of AR study, you know, um, the, we decided, I decided to really focus on elucidating the gene expression landscape of the invasion front, because that's where we really want, that's where really the, the bread and butter, uh, the meat of it is. So this comes to me, brings me back to the next, to the next part of my talk, which is using the device to identify invasive gene signatures in epithelial cancers. So more so than invasion rate, invasion distance, we are interested in what genes the invading cells express, which is basically the molecular phenotype of the invading cells. To start off, um, I focused on a molecule known as GDF15. So this GDF15 is a pet molecule of mine because I worked on it as a, as a graduate student. Um, this, is, this molecule is also known as macrophage inhibitory cytokine. It is a member of the TGF beta superfamily, and it is a known marker of metastatic cancers in uh, metastatic cancer in both for both prostate and colorectal. So I actually came from prostate lab. So, um, um, <clears throat> so in this study, um, down here is just a receiver, receiver operator curve where you co where you see a positive correlation between serum macrophage cytokine one or GDF15 with the presence of bone metastasis in prostate cancer patients. So there's a positive correlation between serum levels and bone metastasis. And on the right panel here, you see serum uh, <coughs> accumulative survival curve of colorectal patients with different levels of GDF15. Essentially, patients with higher levels of GDF15 have an overall lower survival rate than patients with a uh, lower level of GDF15. So GDF15 is an important marker both of metastasis and clinical outcome. So in my own work as a graduate student, um, I found that in addition to GDF15 being a marker of metastasis, we observed differential, differential staining of GDF15 in prostate cancer xenografts. So down here in the top row, you see um, these are what we call immunohistochemical slides, where we cut the prostate cancer xenograft, the, the tissue, into four micron slices, and we stain them from different stains such as hematoxylin, eosin stains to stain for nuclei, cellular protein, uh, to stain for specific proteins such as GDF15 or VGF and negative IgG as a control. So even at a low power setting, you can, you can easily appreciate that this, also brown is positive for staining and blue is no stain. So even at low power, low power magnification, you can easily appreciate that the staining pattern of GDF15 is differentially localized within the, the, within the xenograph itself. And it appeared to be near regions of necrosis where there are uh, the source of blood. And if you look at higher power magnifications of the xenograph, you can see that um, heaviest GDF staining, staining, GDF staining occurs in cells that appear to be palisading towards the regions of necrosis and blood. 
So there might be so based on that there might be some correlation between a bio active ongoing biological process such as invasion maybe and GDF15 expression. This is not seen just in one field of view. We see that in multiple views of view of the same of the same xenograph. Furthermore, I've also elucidated that the expression of GDF15 can be modulated by mechanical signals. Mechanical signals. So this is work done in the full lab over at the mechanical engineering, where we use a, a, a tool known as the micropost array, which is like its name suggests, a post, an array of posts. By regulating the height of the post, we are able to modulate the stiffness of the attachment substrate. What we find that is that on taller substrates, which is softer substrates, GDF15 levels increase, and on more rigid substrate, GDF15 levels decrease. So this work suggests that GDF15 responds to mechanical signals such as stiffness. And this led us, uh, and I might just want to bring up to you again, um, in cancer invasion being an interplay of different factors such as mechanical and extrinsic and intrinsic factors. So this, based on this, this led us to kind of hypothesize that the ongoing invasion process where cancer cells invade into the ECM, they might cause a change in the local rigidity of the surrounding uh, environment. They might feedback as a feedback to the cell as a mechanical signal to induce a change in cellular phenotype. This can also occur in CTCs when they undergo shear stress, and you know, and also in the distal metastasis when they colonize this site, they may experience a different mechanical signal that cause them to undergo a phenotypic change. Of course, this is only purely talking about mechanical signals. We have not considered the fact the, the role of both bi biochemical or cellular factors as well. But this is just kind of like a hypothesis based on what we know. Vascular. Vascular, yes. So <clears throat> with that in mind, that will also suggest that GDF15 will be more highly expressed in the invasion cell, uh, in the invasion front of prostate cancer, cancer tumorides. So in fact, we do see that. Um, so, um, so we what we did was we stained. We, oh, sorry, we took the um, prostate cancer tumorites that we grew. We performed IHC on them. We sectioned them at four microns, and we stained for GDF15 as well as uh, KI67, which is a marker of cell proliferation. And this is um, to the left. It's just a low power magnification of the xenograph uh, of, the, of the of the tumorite. On the right here is a higher power magnification of the Tumorite. So on the right here is just a H and E stain showing just a regular structure of the uh, of the tumorite, and you can see here there are certain uh, several cells invading into the collagen. And if you, um, I'll just skip KIC7 first, but let's just focus a little bit on GDF15. So you can see that in GDF15, um, there's heavier staining in the cells that are invading towards the into the collagen, and this uh, if you this is better visualized by using a, doing a 3D surface plot of the staining intensity. So this kind of supports what we see, what we hypothesized, proposed previously. And you know, KS is what other markers do you think you could stain for or analyze for in those aggressive cells? Um, so right now, I'm just looking at GDF. Uh, for right now, for, yeah. for just for this right now, I'm, we're looking at GDF15. Um, but we are adopting a more of an omics approach. So we are looking at gene expression analysis of these invading cells. I've successfully isolated them, not in prostate <coughs> cancer, but in breast cancer, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Is uh, it part of your thinking that these cells undergo an EMT transformation? Not just yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you could talk about, you, you can think of it as some uh, EMT related. Um, I think there's a lot of research that shows that EMT is not the all of metastasis. And, uh, you know, it's more than just that. Um, but okay, so so seeing GDF15 overexpression at the invasion farm was pretty nice and you know satisfying to see that, and it kind of supports the theory that our our model proposed. And uh, in addition, you know you see also see KR67. So this basically just tells you we did KR67 to make sure that the cells were actually proliferating in the in the in the tumor, and you know seeing that is uh, well I think I better hurry because I'm running out of time. Um, so yeah, okay, let's just move on. Um, so in summary, through the use of a mechanical sensitive biomarker known as GDF15, we're able to demonstrate a positive correlation between GDF15 expression and invasion, together with ki 67 marker of proliferation. So what we really want to do is to isolate the invasion front for a more, um, more omics approach towards uh, to identifying novel markers of maybe invasion. 
so this was this, the following work that I'm going to present will be done on triple negative breast cancer cell lines, which is why oh, I'm in breast cancer lab right now. So, um, so what I've done is basically isolated the invading subpopulation from the non-invading subpopulation. And long story short, they are phenotypically distinct. So this is how the tumoroid looks like. We have uh, the non-invading cells are classified as the cells that are localized within the tumoroid. They are not invading into the collagen. And the invading cells are classified as those uh, bright spots here. Uh, this is low magnification, so you don't see the cellular substructures, but these are all invading cells into the collagen. I've managed successfully managed to isolate these two subpopulations as matched controls. So you know when well, we subject them to gene expression analysis using a microarray, uh, the, the FE matrix uh, 2.1 SD 2.1 array, and you know based on the PC analysis, you know <clears throat> we see there's a clear distinction between the non-invading and invading cells. So, yes. How can you be sure that the difference is between that you said the other types of cells mixed with the collagen? Um, I'm sorry. Um, could you rephrase that? Um, how do you know you have a pure tumor cell population in the invading? So, uh, so this is a breast cancer cell line. So this is what we presume to be pure. Almost 100%. So this is from your device. Yes, this is from my device. Yeah, this is from my device. So, oh, I'm sorry. I grew so I grew breast cancer cell lines in the device. You know, we mapped, uh, we let them grow for three weeks. After three weeks, we took out the device. We isolated the invading cells from the non-invading cells. We isolated RNA from those invading cells and non-invading cells, and we sent them for microarray. And uh, and based off on the results of the microarray, we did a PC analysis plot, and we see. Basically, that the invading and non-invading are phenotypically distinct. So you might see also separation between uh, you know, different batches. Well, this is because I have to say that this was done at one time point, both the cell separation and the microarray run, and this was done in another batch, probably another batch of different chips. So that could have explained why you know you see such a difference between uh, non-invading cells or invading cells as well. The reason the non-invading zone is completely black. Is because there's a cover yeah. over that on the tube? It's full of cancer cells. Chock full of cancer cells. Really? Yeah. So um, I guess maybe you weren't, you weren't here earlier on. So uh, what we did was, yeah, what we did was that we injected cells, a mass of cells. Okay. okay. So was it after 21 days? 21 days, yes. So the, because we are able to achieve 21 days of culture, we allow enough time for the cells to re resolve themselves, especially from invading and non-invading. That oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you section your gel, will there be uh, edge effect when your cell adhere to the uh, border of the gel? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but you know, I think because we are looking at again, we are because we are not isolating a single cell, so we are still looking at a population level. So the contamination from the contamination from the edge effect will be minimal as compared to the the non edge effect. So definitely, that's a. I mean, because again, yeah, this is this is just the biology of how it is done, and I think this is, I think in terms of sample preparation, this is a problem that everybody will face, and you know, um, but I think with regards in this experiment at least, the level of contamination is uh, minimal. Of course, you know, there may be some experimental errors, but you know, yeah. When you section it, you can just remove the edge and clean up. Section. Oh yeah, we, we can do FFP, but what we really wanted to do was light cell isolation. So FFP is good, but you know you get you get problems with RNA integrity, and you know it, fixing is a problem. There's a lot of things you need to consider with FFP samples, uh, but with light cell you don't have to worry too much about that. And that's why we, I mean, and you think of it as you know we are meeting a higher level of uh, we're meeting a high level higher level of uh, QC is that if we are able to do it in life, we have no problem doing FFP. So I think we wanted to meet that bar, high bar first. You get anything interesting out because it looks like the batch is separated on PC one and yeah, so the type I mean, separated on PC two. Yeah, so I mean we're not sure. So Pete is helping me with uh, so Pete Ulinitz is the guy who is helping me with the gene expression uh, expression analysis. So we are trying to sort through this data right now and you know maybe make some sense out of it and uh, definitely yeah, you know, that's something on 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 our list. Um, so uh, what we're more interested in is what are the genes that are being expressed in the invasion front. So this is, again, Peter helped me a lot with this. Um, so we did a path, eye pathway analysis. This is maybe something that more, more, of more interest to you. 
Um, so basically, we found 252 target genes that were differentially, uh, not differentially expressed, but affected during invasion. So this was done, this, uh, these 250 genes were identified using a cutoff of 1.54 change in expression with a p-value of less than 0 0.05. And using these 252 significant, statistically significant genes, we were able to um, kind of classify them using gene ontology based on biological processes. And we have, uh, using a weight pruning method, you know, classifying 10 genes per term and a p-value of less than 0 0.05, we were able to kind of classify these genes, 252 genes, not 252 genes, uh, we were able to come up with seven main processes that were, in, that were involved in the process of uh, invasion. And not surprisingly, you get, you know, extracellular matrix organization was one of them, um, which is what, what you were probably asking about, matrix, me, metallomatrix, uh, matrix metalloproteases. Um, you know, we also have response to extracellular stimuli, which is, you know, which is very heartening to me because Mechanical signals is a, is an extracellular matrix stimulus, so that's um, something that was good to see that popped up. And you know we have certain interesting things like rhythmic process and anatomical processes. So I mean, I'll, this is just a kind of like this. This is not a comprehensive list of the genes that were upregulated out of the 252 genes. Maybe only 40 or 20, 30 or 40 are actually expressed here. So again, I'm again with Peter. I'm, we are going trying. We are going through this analysis. Um, you know, um, hopefully we will be able to make some sense out of it. <coughs> Not some sense, more sense out of it. I'm sorry. So, uh, in addition, so right now we are just looking at MR microarray. What we really want to do from biological pr perspective is to validate that the target genes are really being upregulated at the invasion front. So, looking at two genes that we identified, Bax1 and Win5A, we stain the tumoroids. Uh, so, these are cancer cells again grown in the device for 21 days. This time around, we isolated them, we sectioned them, and we stained them for HE. Either the Bax1 protein, Win5A, or KIC7. So as you can see here, we do see upregulation as indicated by heavier staining at the invasion cells in the invasion cells for both Bax1 and Win5A. So this validates our what we see in the microarray. So we know that the findings we obtain in the, at the mRNA level are translated at the protein level. So we also tried that on different patient material. We see that. Interestingly, we don't see the same staining pattern for all patient material. We only see maybe one or two genes that demonstrate similar patterns. I say for PDX1, we see a, different staining, a higher staining of uh, BEX1 only in PDX1, but PDX2 and 3, we don't really see that. So this was not, I would say it was uh, this is a bad result, but you know, again, it highlights again the biological heterogeneity that you experience between patients and between samples. So this is just uh, the H&E um, staining of the Bax1 and Win5A. Um, so um, more so than just looking at the genes being upregulated, we really want to do a network reconstruction of, of the pathways involved in regulating these genes. Because we're looking at gene expression analysis, this is only the output of invasion. It is not a causal relationship. And target this, while these genes may be useful for a biomarker, for diagnostic purposes, they may not be useful, of, uh, they may not be of therapeutic benefit. So what, we, what is also relevant is to up identify the upstream signaling pathways that really kind of affect the expression of these genes. So to do that, uh, I actually talked a little bit to Marcy, I don't know, um, worked a little bit on Cytoscape. Um, so Cytoscape has this application known as the iRegulon application. Um, so I, I guess everybody's familiar with that. I won't go too much into it. This is just the link, uh, this is the uh, citation. Uh, from Stein Earth's lab um, detailing the process of how they do the iRegulon pathway. So this is a preliminary analysis. Um, basically using the iRegulon application, we were able to identify predicted transcription factors. In this, uh, in this uh, force directed map, we have down-regulated genes as green squares, up-regulated genes as red triangles, and predicted transcription factors as blue hexagons. So um, you can see that, you know, interestingly, you have this one big uh, green square. So this green square was a down-regulated gene that's also identified as a potential transcription factor that regulates the other genes. So, um, so yes. So this was a force directed map. What were you using as your code? Uh, so this, well, I can't remember the details. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we, we used, um, so the Cytoscape they have, I used the G-mania um, force directed. Um, so okay. yeah, so I, I used the default settings. I haven't played around too much with the, uh, the coefficients and stuff like that, um, but yeah. So this is preliminary, but um, so I mean, but if anybody has any more experience in um, elucidating 
pathway analysis, like you know, uh, from Taki genes, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to hear any input because you know I, I think I need help with this uh, because. Uh, <laughs> so right now we only have a list of predicted signal uh, transcription factors based off of the list of genes that we have. Uh, so what I really want is to identify the signaling path, the signaling pathways that affect these transcription factors. So if anybody knows of anything, please let me know. So in conclusion, um, I'll just quickly run through. We've created, I've developed a device that allows for robust long-term 3D culture. And using the device, we are able to identify potential applications to biomarkers based off on like GDF15, uh, which is a known marker of metastasis, which based on our results might be more useful earlier on in the earlier stages of disease. We are also able to adopt, adopt an omics approach towards identifying the invasion prof, uh, gene expression profile of invasion invading cells. Um, right now, I've only done RNA, but it's possible to do it with DNA and protein proteomics. Um, so the, the good thing about this is that we have a known bio, we have a known biological function invasion, and with that, by analyzing the genes, we are, we can clearly associate these genes or any biomarkers identified with a known biological function. And this might help in helping us uh, develop better stratification markers for personalized medicine. Although, of course, of course, the network reconstruction still needs work. And uh, based off our preliminary analysis, it will appear that different individual patients will have a different, quite a unique gene signature, um, which we'll need to consider if we want to move on with this. All right. um, with that, I'd like to thank all of you. And I'd like to acknowledge my past labs, the full lab over in mechanical engineering. Um, my current lab, um, River, um, and as well as the ULAM, and of course the DNA sequencing core. Any questions? <laughs> yes. So, okay. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. sorry. My lab study is neck cancer. Oh yes. I am actually looking to broad broaden. I'm. I'm looking to broaden the application of this device to multiple cancers. So pancreatic is one. I know head and neck cancers is one because in vivo models, I believe, are difficult to obtain using head and neck. So I think this is something that we could possibly talk a little bit about. Um, so pancreatic is, a, of course, another interest of mine, liver. Um, so basically, cancers that are in dire need of biomarkers for better diagnostics, I think that's where we want to really expand into. So I have a couple of follow-up yes. questions from that. So one is that, so, um, you know, we study HPV positive and HPV negative. Oh, and okay. Cancer, and one subtype tends to invade locally more often, and another subtype tends to have distant metastasis. Yes. So, which which is your system focused more on? There's clearly a, a difference in the molecular level between those. Mm -hmm. so do you think yours is more modeling the locally local invasion? So, um. I have to say we have to try. If you, uh, I think to answer the question, we'll have to try it. There might be differences in the invasion rate between the ones that metastasize more than those that don't. So um, I would say that invasion rate may be, I mean, based off on like MDA231, the results from MDA231 and uh, uh, some 1.9s, there is definitely a difference. We are able to differentiate, uh, differentiate between high, more invasive and less invasive cells. Or whether that translate to metastatic, um, I think that's something we have to um, talk about. And I can think of a couple of ways that we can do this, um, but maybe we can talk a little bit more, more after this, if it's okay with you. What's the uh, the take rate for your patient-derived xenografts? So far, it's 100%. 100%? <laughs> yes. How many have you tried? Four. Five. Okay. Yeah. So. I, 100%, but 5 or 5 is not much. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that. You know, so when you go to 100, maybe you get, I don't know. Have yes. you ever tried <laughs> infusing cytotoxic drugs in your system? Tachytexel, I've done that. What's that? Tachytexel? Yeah, OK. I've done that. Yeah. So, so these could be, there could be an avatar for patients, potentially. Yes, that is the idea. That is the idea of growing patient material in these devices, subjecting them to a specific therapy that the patient is undergoing identifying resistant cells and phenotyping them for markers of resistance that could be used for additional second line therapy. Because the take rate in mice even is exactly. below 100%. Yes. They, yep. And some 149, that was the 149th patient tumor sample that they tried to grow in That's, culture, and it was only the second successful cell line. Yes. So, and and the fact that we can, I, mean, I think the fact that I, can, I was able to culture pleural effusion, I think it's very heartening to me. Uh, because you know, being able to do that is 
you come, you have patients coming in with lots of fluid infusion, and they don't know what to do with that. And you know, maybe we can just use that. Uh, but you know, it's still early. But you know, I'll definitely, if, uh, I'll be happy to talk more about. Have you tried any non-transform cell lines like the MCF10As? Uh, MCF10As, I've. Yeah, I've well, anything. So MCF, I've tried. So MCF10As do invade. They do. Yeah, they do invade. But the thing is, with MCF10As, they are not really normal. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I mean. They're not transform either. Um, so the ones I've used are transform, actually. The rest transform, I think. Yes, rest, rest transform. Yeah, but we can talk more about it. Yeah, so I think to really use a proper control, will be have, we have to use primary primary cells like um, uh, primary Major. untransformed yeah. human memory epithelial cells, or like um, like say untransformed squamous yeah bronchial epithelial cells, and, and and those type of primary cell lines to use as a real negative control. Yeah, um, HMACs are really easy to get. Yeah, HMACs are really easy. Yes. Uh, well, what's the uh, what's the uh, uh, rate in your in different cell line with your device. Invasion rate? Uh, invasive rate. In the percentage of invasive cells. Percentage. Oh. Ooh, percentage, I think it's kind of hard to, because the cells, um, it will be easy if we could quantify the center mass, but because the mass, the center mass is so tightly packed with cells that we are unable to, to quantify how many, how many cells there are in there. But I would say maybe 10%. <laughs> You know, um, <laughs> just eyeballing it, you know. It's very large. I was going to say one yeah. thousand. One thousand could be. I mean, so I, I can't say for sure. I can't give you a, a, a number. Um, but I think, you know, well, we could, we could, no, actually, we, we maybe be able, we should be able to do that. Um, so looking at the H&E, so looking at the H&E, we can probably, because this is a four micron slice. So this is a slice of tissue, four microns deep, thick. And this is across the tumor. So we can probably quantify how many cells are here versus how many cells in there. I'll say maybe on orders of 100 or even 1,000, probably. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, but the good point. Yeah, that's something I should consider. Yes? So your device is uh, designed for solid tumors. Have you thought about adapting it to, say, blood tumors or blood cancer? So I have not tried it yet. Uh, but I think lymphomas might be something of yeah. uh, Producing a closed channel for us. Yes, yes, this is something definitely. Are you working on lymphomas? No. I, I have a doctor friend. Oh, okay. I see. I see. I see. Yeah. Um. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice work.